Today, our armour-plated housing bubble. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Lulis. It's one of the latest posts covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian and New Zealand flavour. And I'm joined again by Joe Wilkes. Hi, Joe. Hi, Martin. So there's an interesting article which came out which basically said the New Zealand property market is perfect. Armour-plated, no problem. Yeah, armour-plated, uh, full helmet on. Uh, we've got gauntlet, the whole lot. We walk into battle with a big, big, um, uh, heavy, um, broad, uh, sorry, claymore. And uh, no, pretty much immune to any anything that could possibly affect the housing market. Uh, we, there's there's nothing to say here. Right, and of that's in reaction to a Bloomberg article which came out, um, which essentially said that New Zealand and Canada look to be the most exposed housing markets. They were talking of, about that in the context of the Economist's latest data on house price growth and some other metrics. And they were arguing that uh, New Zealand is right up there in terms of risk. So this is, article is in reaction to that Bloomberg article. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the Bloomberg article was basically suggesting that New Zealand house prices are 57% overvalued, which... Um, uh, we've got uh, the cheerleaders are out in force in New Zealand, and I found this quite an interesting article because it's it's come and been written by somebody who, in 2008, predicted a 30% slump in New Zealand house prices. Um, uh, I don't know whether they've got themselves a big portfolio in the years since, but the um, the, the the narrative of this article was was very very different. Um, and I thought we'd just come back and counter it today and just say, well, look, you know, everything isn't rosy. There are things that um, that don't make sense. And just to add to the to the New Zealand, um, uh, I suppose metrics that that people would look and we've covered lots of things about what's caused it why it's happened and why things are changing now why people should be a little bit cautious um you can see from the uh, the real house price data that new zealand sits at the top of a pile of some fairly um some fairly dubious characters um right up there you can see ireland uh led the way a decade ago and and, and you know languished in the doldrums for many years before making its recent credit recovery um, and that is again because they did a lot of interesting things that manipulated the market, holding stock off the market, taking the bad debt off the developers' books and sticking it um, via the banks onto the onto the uh, ECB. Now, New Zealand at the moment, 10 years on, as we enter a time where things globally are looking a little bit shaky, I know stock markets are, are not telling us that, um, but sales of manufactured goods across the world, they're, 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 um, they're dropping off a little bit now. Um, New Zealand sits at the top of, of, of this uh, real house price index risk list. Um, just underneath, you've got um, Ireland bouncing back up again, Australia, as we well know, um, Canada a uh, feature in, in there, and they've had a big boom. Britain, uh, we had our boom and our bust, and we're still fairly high up the list. Um, US uh, prices back up to pretty much where they were uh, pre-GFC. Um, Italy, you can see there uh, at the bottom of that list, right back down to, to where, where, you know, where it's been languishing. So the article was really quite interesting, but it, it, and it, it mentioned some quite interesting pieces, but I just wanted to, to go back to sort of just showing people a few things of why we need to be a little bit wary. And this is um, some visuals that have been provided by Visual Catalyst, um, where they look at a number of uh, metrics that you'd compare country to country. Um, they look at house price to rent ratio, house price to income ratio, real house prices, and then credit to households. Now, predominantly, these do cover, or, or visual capitalists have covered what I would call the Western economies, where fiat money has, has dominated from the 1970s. Unfortunately, um, and I think this would have been quite interesting from our perspective, if they had included places like China and India, China in particular is a big trading partner of both Australia and New Zealand, uh, we'd have been able to see where they feature because if your major trading partner's got a private debt problem, um, then that's going to impact on you at some point and vice versa. Um, Australia and New Zealand, New Zealand uh, trades more with Australia at the moment than it does with anybody else. Um, the fact that you've got a fairly high private debt problem is, is going to be a challenge to us for um, 
selling of tourism, perhaps. Um, I think we'll probably find there are fewer skiers coming over from Australia to New Zealand this year to take advantage of, of the no snow that I saw saw last week on the slopes. Um, but if you if you go back to these metrics, so house price to rent ratio, um, and you can see the comparisons. You've got Canada featuring fairly high on the list, uh, 195.9%. Um, the uh, Norwegians fig- figuring fairly high, 168.3%. Um, Sweden 172.8%. Sweden's going through some challenges at the moment. Um, Australia 152.9%. Um, but New Zealand, uh, having not won in the cricket last week, uh, feature first when it comes to uh, house price to rent ratio. So, what this means is that there is a there is a limit. Um, sorry, or there is a, a a point where incomes and rent are pretty high relative to, to the price and what the mortgage costs would be. Now, at some point, there will be a flip over on that where um, tenants can't pay anymore and therefore, or they are paying so much on the housing that it has an impact on other bits within the real economy, new car sales that we touched on in our Carmageddon post. Um, it can have a, a, you know, a knock-on effect to how much money they're going to go and spend in a restaurant or a bar. So these are service industries that, when the tourists aren't around, do rely on the locals to keep the trade going over the winter months. So um, that's something that I felt was quite important and, and a, a counterpoint to what was argued in, in this um, uh, in this article. The house price to income ratio is another major factor because this, again, it points at, at, at the stress that's in the system um, or the, the level of exposure to risk. Now, Canada featured fairly high with uh, 155.3%. Um, Belgium was pretty high at 137.3%. Sweden, again, very high at 1457 Australia, 1357 New Zealand, house price to income measure, first place again, um, like our netballers last night, uh, 156.8%. So again, very, very, very high levels of, of, of house prices relative to what people earn. And, and what people earn is, you know, that's the real economy. That's what things, you know, the, the business services, what we do, what it's able to generate to provide incomes for people. Now, we've touched on this in the past. New Zealand has had a negative savings ratio now for four years. There's only three years, 14, 15, 16, where the savings ratio was positive over the last decade. So we're not saving anything, we're borrowing money, and, and as a result, it's the borrowing and the credit growth which is creating the, 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 the prices. Credit growth was very, very, um, well, it wasn't mentioned, uh, the, the increase in the private debt levels in, uh, in the recent article from Mr. Hickey. Um, uh, real house price rises, so um, this is adjusted for inflation. Um, New Zealand again featured fairly high. Joint fourth this time, we should be disappointed with that result. We can do better than that, New Zealand. Um, Canada uh, was, uh, sorry, we were on 121.9. Um, Canada 124.1. Um, uh, Netherlands 121.9. Uh, the leader was Portugal, 131.8. So they've had very fast house price rises over the last couple of years, remembering that they had a big, big trough um, after the, the GSC. The um, the last one to mention uh, in this graph, I th- again, uh, I would have loved to have seen China included in, in this graph, but I guess the data is just so sketchy that they can't get, get hold of it. Um, but credit to households as a percentage of GDP, um, You've got here um, the, the the known the known uh, winner of, of Switzerland. So um, they uh, one hundred twenty eight point seven percent of of GDP. Um, Australia second place, beating New Zealand. Congratulations. We did struggle on this one, but it's still a high ratio, ninety eight point two percent. And I can't see it. it's gone too small. Now it might be ninety four percent. We, we weren't featuring at the top of that list, but we're still higher than Ireland was pre-bust. Um, and we're still higher than the UK was pre-bust. So I think it's quite important that these these you know things as a counterpoint are added because what, what Mr. Um, Hickey did mention in his article, and I'll give him credit for it because it's been so little publicised. Everyone thinks that we sailed through the GFC, um, New Zealand wasn't affected, everything was rosy. Now, I've read um, uh, some memoirs from, from Alan Bollard who talks about the fact that there was intervention. And Mr. Hickey um, kindly mentions it, and, and you probably got some comments about that. 
Well, it's interesting because he does say specifically that the reserve, and I'm quoting here, the Reserve Bank helped the big four Australian banks avoid a credit crunch by lending them more than seven billion over the late 2008 and 2009 to make sure they could roll over their own short-term loans from the US and European banks. Our government, this is New Zealand, also provided a guarantee of $10.4 billion worth of bonds issued by the New Zealand arms of the big four Australian banks and obviously Kiwi Bank. So that's very interesting, right? So around the world, we know that many banks were bailed out, you know, below the surface, as it were. In other words, helped by f providing funding to keep them afloat. We know that, for example, Deutsche Bank in Germany was actually kept afloat by money from the Fed. Um, there's a lot of stuff gone on below the waterline to keep the financial system uh, ticking over uh, a decade ago. And of course, at the time, there was almost no disclosure of all of this activity. And now it's beginning to come home. I guess the point to make is twofold. Firstly, the interconnectedness of the way that the financial system works, which means that effectively, if you do have an issue in one part of it, you know, be it Deutsche Bank falling over or something else, it has an immediate knock on effect elsewhere. And therefore, there are there needs to be things taken, steps taken quite quickly. And the second is that the amount of um, noise uh, at the time might actually be controlled by the politicians and by the banking system around the world. But the amount of intervention that actually comes through later indicates that we were much nearer the edge of the precipice than was publicly admitted at the time. And so, you know, you don't know at the time just how close to the edge of a disaster we are. And if you think, bring that forward now and say, well, what about now? The short answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows how close to the edge we are, you know, whether we'll be able to continue this um, massive debt bubble and balloon for another decade or two, or whether, in fact, there will be some trigger, be it, um, I guess, the Middle East or China or Deutsche Bank or US or whatever it is, that ultimately is a trigger and creates another crisis. And then the final point is, of course, that last time around, the central banks cut rates by 4 or 5% to be able to actually deal with the crisis. Now, if we have the same thing all over again with rates as low as they currently are, you know, around 1%, just over 1% now, we don't have that same latitude. And that means that unless you go into unconventional strategies like quantitative easing and you know, negative interest rates, a la Japan, um, they don't have the same firepower. So in that context, you've got to say that while superficially, you know, the economy in New Zealand and maybe even Australia looks armour plated, when you dig below the surface, I'm afraid some of the moving parts would suggest that the risks are a lot higher than many would want to concede. Yeah, and I think that um, you know that there was a lot of uh, of discussion on on this this particular article about um, immigration or keepers going. Immigration hasn't worked in in many other places. It didn't work in Ireland because immigration yeah. carried on going up after their after their bus. Um, there's a lot of talk about the you know the Chinese saw us through. Um, the Chinese saw us through. They've grown their private debt exponentially. In fact, if you look at the, the growth in their private debt from 2008 to today, um, they've grown they've gr their, their growth in private debt has been at a pace that it took the Americans 20 years to achieve. Um, so it's enormous. It's, it's enormous uh, the, the amount of, um, of spending that's gone on. And I read an article recently that, that criticised the, um, the, the spending that had taken place in China. The reality of China is that they can make GDP whatever they want it to be. Um, all they have to do is just go print, print some more money, make some more loans, build some more empty um, apartments, and I think they've got 60 million of them already, um, build some roads to nowhere. There's some wonderful infrastructure in China that leads to nothing. Um, and, and these are things that they can do to keep the workforce going and to keep GDP going. So if, if they say next year we're going to target GDP at 7%, it will happen um, until it doesn't happen. And, and it's interesting to see now how quickly things seem to be turning in, in, in you know, the new car sales and all the other bits and pieces, the drop off in log prices that we're seeing into, into um, to China. Um, it's going to be very interesting when we have put all our eggs into that basket and Australia's, you know, we're heavily tied to you guys as well. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this next decade plays out with three economies who, yeah, they weathered it, 
with massive amounts of private debt, um, which the others, other economies weren't really able to do, and, and it's been government debt that's funded the, the, the recovery in the, in, in the rest of the West. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the bottom line here is I've heard so many times people say, ah, but our economy is different, right? So, you know, the normal rules of economics and the normal you know, rules that we've seen um, applying doesn't apply to us for some particular reason. You know, it's the resource sector and that gives us protection or, um, you know, something else, right? Um, I'm afraid I'm very sceptical of those particular points of view because again and again, you, what you discover is that everything looks fine until it's not. <laughs> And uh, I fear that we're going to get to that point where suddenly, you know, the armor-plated economy um, suddenly turns a bit sour. So um, don't know when, don't know how, but uh, I'm very sceptical of those who claim that there is some unique secret source which will protect a particular economy from everything that's happening. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think that um, you know, if you if you if you want to armor plate yourself, I don't know whether you'd need to go and buy gold helmets off John, but um, I would I would be saying to people at the moment that you know just be be mindful of what's going on and and, and be very wary at the moment that there are stats that are disappearing. So I mentioned the um, uh, the uh, bankruptcy stats that I can't find since April. Uh, the new car sales. Um, and the drop off in volumes isn't being reported. And we've got an incredible amount of cheerleading going on from the press. Um, and I question the, the independence of the press in New Zealand because, uh, you know, the, the, the narrative last year was so emotional about you've got to get in, you've got to get in, you've got to get in. I mentioned the, um, the uh, commentator who was on Seven Sharp last week talking about you've got to go and take interest-only mortgages and don't worry about paying capital back because price rises are sorted out over the time that you own the house. Um, there is a lot of influence from whether it's whether it's vested interests or you know people who are being sponsored by the banking sector. Westpac's economist has talked about seven percent price rises over the next next twelve months. These things are ludicrous when you look at the drop off in real activity in the economy. So um, be careful. Probably don't need a helmet, but just be mindful. <laughs> and uh, stay tuned and watch more from DFA because we'll tell it as it is. And do feel free to share the messages because there are a lot of kids out there who they may not want to look at me and Martin's middle-aged faces, but hopefully they'll get a little bit of information. <laughs> OK, thanks for that, Joe. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk again soon. Thank you, mate. Cheers.